welcome. Before we get too far into this evening's event, I would like to ask one of our chaplains, Father Roger Boucher, to pronounce an invocation. Heavenly Father, we praise you always for your goodness. We ask you for your grace tonight to open our hearts and minds that we may learn in new ways to praise your, your love for us and to establish your kingdom. We ask this through your beloved Son, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed is our Lord at all times, now and always, and forever and ever. So I hope you will allow me to just take a few moments to introduce you to the college. I don't need to do a head count uh, to tell you this is the largest crowd we've had for an evening event. Um, Thomas More College is just over 30 years old, one of the youngest liberal arts colleges in the country, one of the oldest campuses in the country. It's an 18th century, 1726 farm. Some of you noticed when you came in. At the center of the campus, 18th century buildings. I'm sure a number of you are thinking right now, what I actually noticed was that you have 18th century parking, <laughs> 18th century lighting. <laughs> Charlie McKenney beneath the exit sign is the Vice President of Development. If anyone would like to endow <laughs> lights or parking lot, it's a great naming opportunity. <laughs> College has had an excellent reputation for years for its commitment to the humanities, and that's witnessed by very high percentage of our graduates, 60% of our graduates go on to law school and graduate school. It's extremely high. Um, if you stay, and I encourage you to stay for the reception afterwards, you'll also get a good sense of the college by meeting some of our students um, during the reception. And I, again, I would encourage that. In addition to its commitment to humanities, the core curriculum here, the integrated curriculum here, it's not simply the core curriculum takes the students through four years of humanities, natural science, mathematics, classical languages, <coughs> economics, politics, literature, philosophy, and theology. And as a Catholic institution, I suppose I can't say that. Um, as our particular kind of Catholic institution, we are completely loyal to the magisterium of the church. All our students during their sophomore year study in Rome as well. And uh, we usually don't film things. This is being filmed now, so perhaps some of the students in Rome will see this. Today is Dr. Connell's birthday, students in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Paul. I've got this as a shot for you. <laughs> Typically, we would have uh, six, 12 guests at an evening lecture. Uh, so this is extraordinary. I, the guesstimate is there's around 100 guests. The number of guests may, in fact, exceed the number students. <laughs> Again, I welcome you. Uh, debate is something that my colleague behind me, John Zmirak, has been promoting over the last few years. It is one of the ways that we pursue in common, the faculty and the students together, one of the ways we pursue wisdom. I hope that you enjoy the experience tonight, and now I'll hand things over to John Zmirak, Professor of Literature and author of many books in our writer in residence. Thank you, William. Very proud to have with me two of the most distinguished writers in their fields alive. Uh, the most distinguished Catholic philosophical writer in, in English, I would say. Um, no false modesty. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the leading expert on jihad and political Islam, Robert Spencer. Um, I am the writer in residence here. I teach the rhetoric classes and the literature classes. Um, I'm a, I also write and edit books. This book happens to have essays by <coughs> Mr. Spencer and Dr. Kreeft in it. It's called Disorientation. It's the 14 heresies that steal students' faith in college. And there'll be some copies downstairs if any of you are interested in getting it. There will also be some, uh, Mr. Spencer will be signing some copies of his books downstairs at the reception. So it's fun to have one chapter of my book at battling the other chapter. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Spencer wrote the essay on multiculturalism and Mr. Kreef wrote the essay on progressivism. And it seems to me that their views in the book lead into the debate tonight. One of them thinks progressivism is a greater danger. Secularism, modernism, 
the legacy of the Enlightenment is a greater danger to the church than the alternative religion of Islam. Mr. Spencer believes that bad as the, as the Enlightenment it might be, there are even worse things. <laughs> so I think it will be a very interesting exchange. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kreeft has written a book called Between Allah and Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's the third book he's written exploring the interface and the interactions and the commonalities and divergences between cr Christianity and Islam. It's a recent book. Well, what's the name of the publisher? Um, let's see. Yeah, let's hold it up. <laughs> InterVarsity <laughs> Press. I encourage you to pick it up. It's as, as, uh, like all of his books, it's beautifully written and very winning. Actually, it's the only one in which uh, Islam and Christianity are compared. Oh, really? Oh, uh, okay. The other two, including a refutation of moral relativism, just happen to have characters from my forthcoming novel, one of which is a Muslim and the other of which is a Christian. I see. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I, th I thought it was a, a longer less. I just wanted to take that opportunity yeah. to plug my forthcoming novel. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Plug away. Plug away. Uh, Mr. Kreitz is also a professor of philosophy at Boston College, author of more than 45 books. I've read a large percentage of them um, and enjoyed them immensely, and I'm very honored and proud he was able to make it. Mr. Spencer is author of 10 books? Yes. 10 books. I um, to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> but he also, he's also wet, uh, the editor of jihadwatch.com, where he writes 10 posts a day. So I think if you add them up, they might be a sort of... They would reach the moon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. So uh, the format tonight is fairly straightforward. Uh, the, the, we structured the debate the way we structure our other debates on campus. The Edmund Campion Debate Society is the student debate group where we, we have Oxford-style parliamentary debates on topics of interest <coughs> in the intellectual life. Our last one was resolved that the American Revolution does not meet the criteria for just war, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. But the, uh, the American revolutionaries won that debate by, by two votes. Um, so. <laughs> the previous debate was about whether prohibition should be passed. And each debate is set in the time. So the debate in prohibition pretended to be 1917. The debate for the American Revolution pretended to be 1776, July 7th. A bunch of Catholics in Baltimore debating the wisdom of joining the revolution. Well, this one is set in the present. We don't have to pretend. We don't have to pretend we're in 7th century Arabia or 15th century Byzantium. Islam and the West are facing each other. They are interacting. Some, sometimes in a bloody way, sometimes for, perhaps in a creative way. Tonight we're going to, figure, we're going to try to figure out whether or not there, there is a hopeful resolution for Orthodox Islam and the contemporary West and Catholicism, three different things. Um, we, our, our topic is resolved that the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim, a, 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 a line I think I took from your book. And uh, Mr. Spencer will be speaking in the affirmative, so he speaks first for 20 minutes, then Do Dr. Kreeft responds for 20 minutes, then there'll be about 20 minutes of them asking each other questions, then I'll pose them each a question or two, and then after, after a bathroom break, you will, will be opportunities for questions from the audience. So, Mr. Spencer, would you like to lead off? Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to uh, everyone at Thomas More College for hosting this. I think this is a discussion that uh, needs to be had in the public square and is all too often elided, ignored, and uh, not held where it should be. And so I hope that... Uh, this will perhaps bring some needed attention to these questions. It's a great honor for me to be appearing with Dr. Craig, who was my professor many hundreds of years ago. And uh, at that time, we used to uh, spend quite a bit of time uh, outside class, actually, uh, playing ping pong. And he was so much better at it than I was that he would play on his knees and uh, still win. But uh, I'm hoping perhaps at the end of tonight we'll both still be standing, at least uh, figuratively. In any case, uh, Dr. Kreeft's book, Between Allah and Jesus, is one that I read with great interest. And I certainly see what is the motive behind what he's trying to do in it, insofar if, as I understand it correctly, and why he would want to 
portray Islam in this manner. Now, the question before us is somewhat uncomfortable. It e even seems kind of insulting to say the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim, uh, especially in a context where we have uh, uh, a Catholic college hosting a debate, and it's as if one of the debate participants, namely myself, is saying that uh, religious people of a certain kind should be discouraged from holding to their religion it seems like something that other religious people should not be in the position of saying. And certainly it is uh, something that most people would reject out of hand on the face of it and say, obviously this is not true because we all know that uh, the, the people who are committing violence in the name of Islam are twisting and hijacking the religion and if they only go back to the teachings of the Quran and of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, then this problem of terrorism and many other attendant problems of Islamic supremacism would have an S. And I think it's in that spirit that uh, Dr. Kreeft wrote his book. Uh, certainly it is something devoutly to be wished that people of goodwill of all faiths could find some kind of common accord and work on that common accord for their shared values. We have even seen that happen between the Catholic Church and Islamic countries at the United Nations against various anti-life initiatives. And so this is something that uh, many people have great hope for. The great danger in holding such a hope is that we fall into wishful thinking and project upon other religious people values that we ourselves may hold or that people of certain religious traditions may hold and that therefore we assume are held by people of all other religious traditions when actually that's not the case. And unfortunately, I must say with regret that I did find a great deal of that kind of thing in this particular book. The uh, idea, for example, is posited several times in the book by the Muslim character, who I think it's fair to say is the hero of the story. Uh, he is, uh, like Dr. Craig's books, which uh, are all marvelous and fluidly written and very persuasive, great influence on my own uh, development, he often has dialogues between various characters, but you can generally tell uh, what side he's on <laughs> and <laughs> what he believes to be the truth. And in this, in this particular book, this, these truths or these uh, uh, things that Dr. Kreeft is positing to be the truths are enunciated most often by the Muslim character. Many times he says that jihad is an interior spiritual struggle. Now that is something that does exist in Islamic tradition. But when we are speaking about the idea of should Muslim piety be encouraged? Should Muslim people be encouraged to be more rigorous and more devout and more fervent in their religious observance? We have to go back to the wellsprings, to the texts and teachings of the Quran and Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, because he is held up in the Quran as chapter 33, verse 21, calls him Uswa Hassanna, or the excellent example of conduct. And in Islamic tradition, he is even exalted in many places as Al Insan Al Kamil, the perfect man. And in, in practice, in Islamic tradition, even though Muhammad is uh, rebuked several times in the Quran, notably in chapter 80, for his sinfulness, in practice, in Islamic tradition, Muhammad essentially is the touchstone of all behavior. And if he did it, then it's good and right and ought to be imitated. Now that's important for the present question because when we have the Muslim character saying jihad is an interior spiritual struggle, he is in fact actually putting himself in the position of contradicting the words and example of Muhammad and the words of the Quran itself. There's an entire chapter of the Quran, chapter 8, called Al-Anfal the spoils of war. There are no spoils of war in an interior spiritual struggle. There's no booty to be captured, there are no slave girls to be distributed among the warriors, and yet that chapter of the Quran and others actually contains instructions for doing just that kind of thing. And a fifth of the spoils are reserved for the Prophet himself. He took part in these wars. He fought actually 78 battles during his career as a prophet, and 77 were offensive in nature. 
The Quran does not teach that jihad is its interior spiritual struggle. The Quran almost unanimously, when it speaks of jihad, when it uses the Arabic word jihad in its various forms, which means struggle, and of course struggle in Arabic has just as many connotations as struggle does in English. You can struggle to quit smoking or to lose weight. You can struggle against communism or uh, have states struggling against one another. So it is also in Islam. But the primary meaning of the word jihad in the Quran is unmistakably warfare. And the uh, Muslim hero of Dr. Craig's book further says that Muhammad never fought against Christians and Jews unless he did so in a defensive manner. That unfortunately is also factually false. In, as, as a matter of fact, the last battle of his career, right before he died, Muhammad went to Tabuk, which was an outpost, a Byzantine imperial outpost in northern Arabia or southern Syria, depending on where you want to put the border. And uh, he, th he went to fight a Christian garrison there of the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, he didn't actually find them there. They left, whether they left in order to avoid fighting him or whether they left because they didn't know he was coming and didn't care and left for their own reasons, we don't know. He, in any case, he was not able to fight them. But unfortunately, he left in chapter 9 of the Quran numerous teachings, which of course are all conveyed as divine revelation that cannot be questioned and has to be obeyed by any pious and observant Muslim. He left instructions to wage offensive warfare against Jews and Christians, particularly in chapter 9, verse 29, which tells Muslims to fight against those who do not obey Allah and his messenger and do not forbid what he has forbidden. In other words, they don't follow the strictures of Islamic law. Even if they are of the people of the book, which is the Quranic designation primarily for Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, which is a tax, that's what the word means in Arabic, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. That verse became the foundation for an elaborate superstructure of laws that are still part of Islamic jurisprudence. They are still part of Islamic political law that Islamists, that jihad terrorists, and that any Islamic supremacist wants to impose over the world today. These laws mandate that non-Muslims of the people of the book must pay a special tax from which Muslims are exempt. As a matter of fact, you can pretty much correlate in Islamic history the strength and the aggression and the rise of the great Islamic empires of the past with the size of the Jewish and Christian communities that were subjugated within those empires and were paying for that imperial expansion. When those communities were exhausted, economically, then the Islamic empires went into decline. This is an, an absolute correlation that recurs again and again and again. The Christians and Jews in Muslim lands were subjugated in accord with that section of the verse, the last part, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. They never enjoyed equality of rights with Muslims. They were denied the right to build new houses of worship or to repair old ones. They were denied the right to hold authority over Muslims so that Jews and Christians were relegated to the most menial and degrading jobs in the society. They were subject to various other humiliating and discriminatory regulations. Now, this is, as I say, I cannot emphasize enough, still part of Islamic law. This is not one sect or one school or one group that's heretical that has made this part of their teaching. This is universal among all the sects and the schools of jurisprudence that are recognized as mainstream and orthodox by fellow Muslims. They all teach that you cannot find one that does not teach the necessity to wage war against unbelievers, to subjugate them under the rule of Islamic law. And they are working. As a matter of fact, Hamas in Gaza has announced its intention to, once it's fully consolidated its power, to impose that system of dimitude and subjugate the Christians that remain there under its, under its uh, institutionalized forms of discrimination. Gangs in Baghdad, they did not have government <coughs> authority to be sure, but they terrorized the Christian community, which as I'm sure you know, is uh, terrorized on a more or less daily basis. And there was just another massacre in a church the other day. They were knocking on doors in Baghdad last year and demanding payment of the jizya, this tax, which was essentially, uh, it amounts to protection money 
that you pay it and then you don't get killed. But you don't pay it or you transgress some of the other laws that are set out for these subjugated peoples and then your life is forfeit. These things are still part of the agenda for Islamic jihadists today. The Islamic jihadists, coming back to the thesis, the, the, the question being debated here tonight, Islamic jihadists routinely portray themselves within the Muslim communities worldwide and among peaceful Muslims as being the most pious, most observant, in other words, best Muslims available. They are, in other words, the Muslims who present themselves as being the true, the pure Muslims. As a matter of fact, the worldwide Salafi movement, that's what it's all dedicated to, is restoring the purity of Islam as they see it. Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, founded the Brotherhood in 1928 after Kamal Ataturk abolished the caliphate, which was the supranational <coughs> symbol of the unity, the supranational unity of the Muslims that transcended all national boundaries. Ataturk abolished the caliphate in 1924. Hassan al-Banna established the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 in Egypt as a direct reaction to the abolition of the caliphate because he believed that without the political aspects of Islam that have never been considered to be separable from the religious individual aspects of spiritual observance in any Islamic tradition, that those without the political aspect of Islam that had been damaged by the abolition of the caliphate, Islam was not being fully observed in the world and he dedicated the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the direct forefather of Hamas and Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, as well as many uh, pseudo-moderate groups in the United States today like the Council on American Islamic Relations and so on. He was dedicating it to restoring what he saw as the fullness of Islamic observance, as the true observance of Islamic piety which involved the subjugation of unbelievers, violence against them if they resisted, and the establishment of Muslims as a special class who would enjoy rights that the other groups in the society did not enjoy. These things are represented around the world today in the Islamic world, in Muslim communities in the West as well, as being part of what it means to be a good Muslim. They make their appeal to peaceful Muslims. They justify their own actions of terror or supremacism and they make recruits among peaceful Muslims by representing themselves as being the embodiment of authentic Muslim observance. Now, obviously there are Muslims who do not consider that acts of terrorism or violence or the supremacist attempts to impose Islamic law over non-Muslims. They don't believe that that is part of their Islamic piety. And certainly I applaud them and I wish there were more of them insofar as they're sincere. They are, however, universally, worldwide, on the defensive today. They are represented as the bad Muslims by their fellow Muslims who are pointing to the texts of the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad to portray themselves as being the ones who are in the right. And so the Muslims who we could look to with hopes of reform, the Muslims who we would look to with hopes of their being our allies, they are the ones who are considered to be the bad Muslims generally in the Islamic community. And it must also further be stated, unfortunately, that there is no theological system in Islam. There is no sect, there is no group within Islam that has formulated a comeback, a, 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 an, an understanding, a construction of Islamic theology based on the Quran that makes a case to reject violence and supremacism and the subjugation of unbelievers. It doesn't exist. There are many individuals who are working against it, but there is no group that we can point to and say, ah, oh, they're the ones we need to work with. In other words, they have not formulated any kind of convincing comeback. The texts are not on their side. There are peaceful, pacifistic texts in the Quran. Dr. Kreif quotes many of them in his book. He does not, unfortunately, quote the violent ones to which I alluded before, and I mentioned one of them specifically. Another one, for example, is chapter 8, verse 60, part of that Al-Anfal, Spoils of War chapter, that directs Muslims to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah. 
Now you can say, well, that doesn't have to do with modern terrorism. That's terror in a much broader sense. But unfortunately, modern terrorists can and do point to that verse and say, that's what we're doing. That's why we're doing what we're doing. We're striking terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah. The peaceful passages, according to mainstream Islamic theologians, and to the preponderance of Islamic theological tradition, do not take precedence over the violent passages. The peaceful passages generally were revealed earlier in Muhammad's career. He was a prophet for 23 years. Over those 23 years, he received revelations from God, which were collected in the Quran. Early in his career, when he was in Mecca, he had a small band of followers facing a very powerful <coughs> pagan Arab establishment of his own tribe, the Quraysh, in Mecca. That's when he was saying, you have your, say to the unbelievers, you have your religion and we have ours. You don't worship what we worship, and we don't worship what you worship, and essentially let's just leave each other alone. That's chapter 109 of the Quran. The unfortunate fact is that when he later moved in the Hijra, or the Hijira, the Hijra to Medina, and became for the first time a political and military leader, the te tenor of the Quranic revelations began to change. And the violence began to, be te began to be taught and began to be carried out by Muhammad himself. Now, mainstream Islamic theologians and the preponderance of Islamic theological tradition teaches that the, if there is a disagreement between two passages in the Quran, then one of the chief ways to understand which one takes precedence for our own day is which one came later chronologically in Muhammad's career. Unfortunately for us, the violence comes later and thus is considered under the principle of al-Nasiq wa mansuq or abrogation to have been canceled, to cancel out the peaceful passages. Or the peaceful passages only apply when Muslims are a small group like the Meccan Muslims were in the first stage of Muhammad's career. So in other words, they're a small group, they're powerless, then they teach tolerance and nonviolence. But later, gaining power, gaining in numbers, the other parts begin to kick in. And you have the violence and the supremacism <coughs> begin to apply. I believe right now we're in the state of transition in the United States, where we're moving from one to the other. And there's a great deal more aggression and a great deal more assertiveness in Islamic communities and by Islamic jihadists against the United States because they see that we are at a tipping point so they can move away from tolerance. A third of the, actually over a third of the attacks against the United States or attempted jihad attacks against the United States that have happened since 9-11, over a third of them have happened in the last year, which means there's been a sharp uptick in the last year. And so this indicates that we are dealing with a group that considers itself to be acting in complete accord with the dictates of Islamic teaching. And thus, to say that we want to encourage Islamic piety is only to encourage, ultimately, the cutting of our own throat, culturally, politically, societally. Thank you. Thank you. I find myself in some difficulties here. I love debates, uh, but I usually debate either pro-choice people or atheists. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a knock them down, drag them out debate between myself and my enemy. Uh, Bob's a good friend, a fellow Catholic, not an enemy. Uh, so I view this more as a discussion than a debate. Uh, a kind of in-house theological exploration between two friends. Only on the ping pong table are we enemies. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't tell you that by the end of one semester he was beating me 50% of the time. <laughs> uh, I also find some difficulty in uh, the fact that this is the first debate I've been ever in in which I had the left chair. I'm usually somewhere <laughs> to the right of the toe of the hunt. <laughs> A third difficulty is that, <laughs> that Bob knows much more about Islam than I do. Uh, it is a minor interest of mine. Uh, and usually when I say something about minor interests, even though it's true, I get in trouble. 
especially about controversial issues like the sexual revolution or homosexuality or Islam. Uh, my final difficulty is that I agree with almost everything Bob said tonight. <laughs> Except one little question in the, spirit, in the spirit of Columbo or Socrates. One last little question. Almost all your premises are true, but do they really entail your conclusion? Seems to me you have two conclusions, two main points, and I disagree with both of them. First is that the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim. The second is that Islam is a greater threat to us than the Enlightenment. So those are the two things I'd like to focus on. I'd like to make very clear that my standards of judgment are exactly the same as Bob's. Uh, first of all, the magisterium of the Catholic Church. Uh, secondly, basic human reason. Thirdly, the facts of history and experience, which can't be denied. Uh, since my ultimate standards of judgment are Catholic, I'd like to start not with my own opinion, but with the, quote, opinion of the Catholic Church. For the first time in 450 years, the Church has issued an official universal catechism. And there is a paragraph in it especially about Islam, just one. But I think this paragraph is just about the most important quotation we could use about Islam. It says, paragraph 841, The Church's relationship with the Muslims. The plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator, in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. Now, I think Bob would agree with that. First of all, he's a Catholic. Secondly, nothing he said contradicted that. But I would like to simply add to what Bob said, rather than contradict it, because that's a half-truth. Uh, I don't think he uttered any lies, uh, and I don't think he uttered any false judgments except his two conclusions, but there's a lot of other things to say. Uh, first of all, the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim. Uh, I know that isn't true because I've met some good Muslims who are good and not bad. I've also met some bad ones. Uh, the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim means that, quote, a good Muslim, unquote, is a self-contradiction. Somebody who is utterly faithful to Islam and the Quran and there are many different interpretations of it. There's not just one Islam, as there is one Catholicism. As you know, there's no magisterium for all the Muslims in the world. They're like Protestants. Uh, they're all over the place. Uh, well, not quite as bad as that. They're not 28,000 different sects and denominations. Uh, but just as all Protestants believe the Bible, all Muslims believe the Quran. That's a, a, a textual unity rather than a magisterial unity. Uh, let's say there's three different levels of Islam that we have to distinguish. First of all, there's the level of terrorist activity, which none of us here supports in the least. We abominate that. That is, there's absolutely no excuse for that. All right. Secondly, there's Islamism. There's the imposition of Sharia law on everyone. There's the refusal to make a distinction between the church and the state. There is the identification of religion with politics, which all good Muslims share. Not all good Muslims justify terrorism. In fact, most of them in the West profess not to. But I have never met a Muslim who believes in the separation of church and state. Uh, and therefore, the notion of universal, equal human rights for people of all religions is not the ideal of any Muslim in the world, including good, pious Muslims that I'm defending. So. I certainly disagree with them on those two levels. But there's the third level, namely personal piety. And on that level, I think we can learn a lot from Muslims. I think they can sometimes put us to shame. Uh, especially the Sufis, who, although they're not mainline Muslims, and although they are labeled by most Muslims as unorthodox, are nevertheless pretty universally respected for their piety. And if you read the writings of some of the Sufis, you find, among some flaky stuff, 
some very profound stuff. Uh, so it is simply not true that the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim. Let, let me tell you a story about a good Muslim. Uh, the character here, Hisa ben Adam, is based on a combination of idealized features of some Muslims I've uh, met or read about and my own imagination. But one of them was a graduate student at Boston College who I had in a course in comparative religions. And he, he always sat next to uh, a Jewish student who I think was Orthodox because he had a beard and a yarmulke uh, and dreadlocks. Uh, and they fought all the time over Palestine, of course. They almost came to blows. But they sat in the front row and asked most of the difficult questions. And I love them for it because I love troublemakers, uh, as long as they don't use physical violence. And they didn't quite use physical violence, although they shouted a bit. Uh, and the rest of the students, about 24 of them, were Catholics, uh, at least nominally, in some stage of dissent or assent. Uh, you know, Boston <laughs> College. It used to be a Catholic college, now it's a Jesuit college. Uh, <laughs> actually, they're not so much non-Catholics who think they're Catholics, they're really Hindus who think they're Catholics because they're all pantheists. They think God is everything. Uh, that's a surprising result of questionnaires. You, you find out amazing things about your students when you ask them questionnaires instead of just teaching them. Anyway, uh, it was time for the break and we learned more during the break than during my lectures. Uh, so I gave them a long break and we were munching on potato chips and drinking coke. Uh, and. Uh, the, uh, the Jewish student, whose name was Zvi, noticed that behind my head on the cinder block wall, there was a faint cross painted there. So he said, that's supposed to be a cross. I turned around and looked, and I realized that that was where the crucifixes used to be before they were taken down. So I turned around, and I was about to, in a shamefaced sort of way, try to give some lame explanation for the fact that the Jesuits took the crucifixes down. Uh, when uh, the Holy Spirit closed my mouth and opened the mouth of the student next to Zvi and said, oh, that's where we used to have the crucifixes before we took them down, in a very proud and self-satisfied sort of way. And Zvi said, I thought he was going to say, when, why did you take them down? He said, when did you take them down? I said, why is he saying when? So the student scratched her head and said, uh, last semester, I think, what month? February, I think. Aha, said Zvi, it was the Bundy money. What's that? Well, so I explained that McGeorge Bundy was the Secretary of State under either Johnson or Carter, one of the presidents, and there was a, a, a course that was going to, uh, a case that was going to come before the Supreme <coughs> Court as to whether it violated the separation of church and state for Catholic schools to receive government grants. Uh, and the president didn't want that to come before the Supreme Court for some reason or other. So he had his secretary of the state, of state negotiate an out-of-court settlement, according to which the answer was yes, if and only if the school was not sectarian, divisive, or exclusionary, whatever that meant. It was vague enough to satisfy everybody. So I pointed out that in the semester following that ruling, every single one of the 21 Jesuit colleges and universities in America took down their crucifixes. Is that a coincidence, he said. <laughs> hmm. Uh, so the Catholics, none of the Catholic students knew that, and they were kind of embarrassed, and one said, we wouldn't do that for money. And Zvi <laughs> smiled wickedly and said, of course not, but I hope you got more than 30 pieces of silver this time. <laughs> the students didn't get it, so it's not, <laughs> they're biblically illiterate. You know, they're not Protestants, they don't read the Bible. So, so Zvi turned to them and said, you see, the first Catholic to accept a government grant was Bishop Judas Iscariot. <laughs> <laughs> so they kept saying, no, we wouldn't do that for money, we did that to be ecumenical. <laughs> At this point, uh, the Muslim chimed in and said, what's the meaning of ecumenical? And he directed the question to me. I was the expert. So I opened my mouth, and for the second time, I was about to utter some sort of answer to his reasonable question, when, again, the Holy Spirit interrupted me, closed my mouth, and opened the mouth of a student next to him, who was another Catholic student, who gave a really stupid answer to the question. <laughs> ecumenical means we all love each other, we're all equal, and here comes everybody, and we didn't want to offend anybody, something like that. <laughs> 
So the Muslim said, oh, you didn't want to offend anybody. Uh, oh, we didn't want to offend others. Oh, others, you mean like me, the Muslim, and my friend, the Jew? Now they were friends. <laughs> and as soon as the two words Muslim and Jew were pronounced, everybody got very quiet, as if a blasphemy or an obscenity had been uttered. <laughs> Those are very concrete words. They have teeth in them. So uh, the Catholic student said, uh, yeah. So the Muslim said, well, you have offended me. What? Yes, you have offended me by taking down your crucifixes. Why have we offended you? You're a Muslim. You don't believe Jesus died on the cross. The Muslim said, you took down your crucifixes to avoid uh, offending me. Uh, you have insulted me. Why have we insulted you? Suppose you came to my country. I think it was Iran, I'm not even sure. You, suppose you enrolled in a Muslim university knowing that it was a Muslim university. Now, we don't have uh, pictures of saints or statues. We think that's idolatry, but uh, when you were in a Muslim university, you know that you were in a Muslim university. Uh, you may see quotations from the Quran. Uh, uh, would you be offended at seeing a Muslim symbol in a Muslim university? Of course not, said the Catholic. Who would? Only a bigot, correct? Yes. Now, you expect me to be offended at a Catholic symbol in a Catholic university. So you expect me to be a bigot. I am highly offended. <laughs> they were very quiet. I could smell the wood burning. <laughs> <laughs> then comes the important part. He didn't, he didn't stop at that. He turned around and faced the class like a fundamentalist preacher. And he said, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I said to myself, who is this? Jerry Falwell in disguise? <laughs> Is this guy a Muslim? Is he from Central Casting or something? Uh, so they, they sort of gradually put their hands up in a very embarrassed way. And he said, well, I don't believe that. I'm a Muslim. The Quran says that's blasphemy. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. It is awful. Allah has a son. The, the very mountains cover their ears before such blasphemy. But, but as a Muslim, I love Jesus. Don't call him Christ. Well, actually, he does. He, he, they do. He's, he's the Messiah. Yes. He's the Messiah. But uh, we don't call him the Son of God. Uh, we call him one of the greatest men who ever lived. And the Quran says nothing bad about him. It says that he performed miracles. He raised the dead. He was virgin born. Uh, the Quran even has Allah rebuke Muhammad and say, you must repent of your sins. It doesn't say that about Jesus. And the Quran also says that Jesus will come at the end of the world to administer the last judgment. So we Muslims have a, a, a deep love of the prophet Jesus, blessed be his name. And like Muhammad, we never say his name without saying, blessed be he or peace be upon him. Uh, now, if we had pictures of the prophet Jesus in our classroom, we would never take them down, not for anything, not for money not for prestige, not even if soldiers from the government came into our classroom with fixed bayonets and said, there has been regime change, there is a new law, you must take down the pictures of your prophet Jesus. Every good Muslim in that class would get out of his seat, go to the front of the picture of the prophet Jesus and say, you take down the picture of our beloved prophet Jesus over our dead body. We would be glad to be a martyr for his honor. And now you take down the pictures of your beloved prophet Jesus simply to get money from the government. So I think perhaps we are better Christians than you are. <laughs> I was the only one smiling. I said, thank you, Holy Spirit, for sending a prophet outside Israel into our midst. <laughs> now, in the Old Testament, God does that very frequently. He sends pagans either to be prophets or to be wise men or more often to be military uh, generals who smash the, uh, the Jews and, and teach them a lesson. They're, they're agents of God. Uh, I think, therefore, since I believe everything in the Bible, that it is quite likely, I know Bob will disagree with this, it's quite likely that one of the reasons why Islam is growing so fast, especially in Europe, and Canada and America, that is, in what used to be called Christendom, which is now apostate Christendom, or Western civilization, one of the reasons is that God fulfills his promises. And one of the promises he made in the Bible is that he will bless everyone who obeys his laws, and he will not bless anyone who disobeys his laws. Now, there's one very basic law that Muslims throughout their history have disobeyed very badly, thou shalt not kill. 
And Christians have a mixed track record there, and it, it's not a track record to be proud of, but it's not, certainly not as bad as the Muslim track record. But if you look at all the other commandments, especially the one that characterizes our society the most, <coughs> namely, thou shalt not commit adultery, I think you can see why the Muslims are being blessed. Why are they conquering Europe? They tried to do it by force of arms for a thousand years. They couldn't do it. Now they're doing it. Why? Well, because they found a weapon much stronger than swords. It's called mothers. They are having children. They are deferring gratification. They're paying it forward. They are respecting families. Uh, and we aren't. There's the, the fruit of the Enlightenment of rationalism, individualism, secularism. Uh, if I had to choose, therefore, between uh, a Muslim and a secular humanist defender of the sexual revolution, enlightenment person, for instance, a Boston College theologian, uh, <laughs> I would certainly choose the Muslim. <coughs> to say that Islam is more our enemy than the, than the Enlightenment is to say that people who believe in love and worship the one true God, even though in ways that are defective and very seriously defective, are worse than the people who don't believe in God at all. That doesn't make sense. How much time do I have left? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Our primary enemies are not Muslims. Our primary enemies are demons, according to Jesus Christ. According to St. Paul, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Throughout our history, we've forgotten that. And we have confused who our enemies are. Whether it's Protestants or communists or Muslims or whoever, uh, we have tried to convert souls by killing bodies. Now, we don't do that anymore, and that's good. But what we've substituted for that, we used to act more like Muslims, that is. Uh, what we've substituted for that, unfortunately, is a kind of indifferentism and, oh, come on, let's just get along, and it's not really that important, which I think is worse. Indifferentism means you don't even play the game. You don't even take truth seriously. At least you don't take religious truth seriously. Playing the game on the wrong side, believing a religion that has very bad things in it as well as very good things in it, a heretical religion, which is all the other religions other than Christianity. I mean, every religion has some very good things and some very bad things in it. Buddhism, for instance. They have a, a wonderful sense of peace and, 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 and mind control and a terrible theology. There's no God at all. They're a pantheistic pudding. Uh, to, to say that our, our fundamental enemies are people who, on a very deep level, believe in love and worship and try to obey the same God, although in a much more primitive way, in a much more barbaric way, and through a, a heretical communications network, but one which borrows enough from Judaism and Christianity so that the attributes of Allah, the 99 names of Allah, are all in the Bible. To say that they are more our enemies than our own apostates, uh, that strikes me as absurd. I debated an atheist once at the University of New Hampshire. They didn't know who I was, and the atheist was one of these analytic philosophers who thought the word God was meaningless. So we didn't get to debate whether God exists until the last 15 minutes. We spent most of the time my trying to defend the meaning of the word God and describing what God's attributes were. Uh, so I thought it was a bad debate. Afterwards, a Muslim came up to me and said, uh, you teach at Boston College? I said, yeah. He said, you're a Muslim, aren't you? I said, no, I'm a Catholic. Oh, oh, I was confused. Why were you confused? Well, your theology is perfect. You know Allah exactly. Now, at that point, I'd never even read the Quran. Uh, it is obvious that the catechism is right. We worship the same God in very different ways. Uh, and there are very serious differences between Christianity and Islam, and I don't want to minimize them at all, and therefore I agree with almost everything Bob said. But let's get a sense of perspective. Our real enemies are, well, who is Jesus' real enemy? Is it Caesar? Is it the Roman soldiers? Or is it Judas Iscariot? 
once we get the Judas Iscariots out of the church, I think we may be able to convert Muslims. And I would love nothing better than to convert Muslims. But the way you convert people is by holiness, by sanctity. Now, if, if we could meet on a fair battlefield here, uh, in which the weapons were not swords, but hearts, if, if we could send saints to Muslim countries, and they could send saints to our country, and we tried to convert each other by the power of sanctity, that would be a wonderful battle because nobody would lose. And I think we'd win more hearts than they would. Thank you. Well, I understand, Dr. Craig, that uh, you, uh, your points about that the Enlightenment is a greater enemy and that we need to uh, have some kind of a convergence or a uh, cooperation between people with a shared morality. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose uh, what I would ask you is how can we find an accord when there are elements of Islamic morality itself that are so deeply problematic. For example, Muhammad, when he was 54, consummated a marriage with a nine-year-old girl. And as he is the excellent example of conduct, that is something that is considered normative, such that uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, when he took power in Iran, lowered the legal marriageable age of girls to nine. And uh, when the aid workers went into the refugee camps in Afghanistan in 2003, they found that half the second grade age girls were already married, and virtually all of the girls older than that were already married. So this is something that is uh, essentially rampant and very hard to eradicate. You mentioned also adultery, and uh, of, I, I think about Islamic marriage law and the fact that a man can have four wives. All he has to do is say, talaq, you were divorced, and she's gone and he can get another, as well as uh, sex slaves that he's conquered in battle, which is specifically allowed for in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, and so uh, there, there's a kind of an appearance of morality that uh, I'm not sure really squares with the kind of morality we might want to form some kind of a cooperative venture with people who hold. Uh, and so I would wonder, for example, also in, in closing, I don't mean to drag out the question too much, but uh, I remember uh, the great Oriana Falacci, who was a, an Italian journalist, internationally famous, who uh, wrote two very, very popular books about the Islamization of Europe after 9-11. And she was a great hero for freedom and for human rights. And I had the great privilege of knowing her toward the end of her life. And she told me that when she interviewed, she did a very famous interview with the Ayatollah Khomeini. And she was preparing for the interview with the translator in a room in Tehran before they went to meet Khomeini. And suddenly a mullah burst in and said, it's a scandal, it's terrible, you're not married. And you're in a room alone with a man. And so he forced her to marry the translator. They have in Shiite Islam temporary marriage, which is essentially, uh, usually, not in Falachi's case, but usually prostitution, uh, a marriage contract with a deadline. You can marry somebody for an hour or for a weekend, and then it expires and you're not married anymore. And yet, so, in other words, the appearance, there's no adultery, sure, why should there be? At least for men. <laughs> but it's not really anything that I would say is really preferable, even to enlightenment, anything goes, morality, which is a, a, a corruption of Judeo-Christian standards. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we square that with the idea that there should be some sort of, a, of an accord between moral people? We can't. However, uh, I don't think most Muslims would defend that, although that may be wrong. Uh, I think it's parallel to our attitude toward the Mormons. Uh, can we tolerate polygamy? Certainly not. But most Mormons don't like polygamy anymore either. And most Muslims don't, in fact, especially in the West, have more than one wife either. It's like, can we tolerate uh, African animism? No. <coughs> can we tolerate polygamy in Africa? No, the church has a big problem with that. Nevertheless, we can still learn something from the Mormons. We can learn something from the Africans. We can learn something from the Muslims. Uh, George Weigel says that the Catholic Church could get its social agenda through Congress if it did just one thing. 
kick out every single Roman Catholic and replace them with a Mormon or a Muslim. <laughs> In some areas, they are better than we are at preaching and practicing morality. In other areas, they're horrible. But we can still learn something from them. And the thing that I try to point out in this book that we can learn from them, uh, it's a difficult concept. It's, it's not formulatable in just one concept, really. It's a, it's a set of concepts. I call it the <coughs> primitive. Uh, certainly, Muslims have a more primitive concept of God. It's not a God of love. It's not a Trinitarian God. It's not a God who has a son or uh, who does an incarnation or who, who, who saves you. Uh, it's, it's a very early Old Testament <coughs> God. But if we don't, if we repudiate those roots entirely, as the Enlightenment does, we don't, we don't really have a God at all. Uh, here's a passage from Chesterton, from uh, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and this, I think, we can learn from Muslims, because, and we better, because we've forgotten it. It's a defense of the fear of God as the beginning of all wisdom which most of our religious teachers say is, is a very bad thing and the beginning of all foolishness. But it doesn't say that the fear of God is the whole story. It's just the beginning of the story. The fear of the Lord, that is the beginning of wisdom. And therefore it belongs to the beginnings and is felt in the first cold hours before the dawn of civilization. The power that comes out of the wilderness and rides on the whirlwind and breaks the gods of stone. The power before which the eastern nations are prostrate like a pavement. The power before which the primitive prophets run naked and shouting, at once proclaiming and escaping from their god. The fear that is rightly rooted in the beginning of every religion, true or false. The fear of the Lord, that is the beginning of wisdom. But... It is not the end. Now, if religion is an organic thing, like a tree, uh, and if this primitive fear of God is its roots, and if we have detached from our own roots, and if a religion like Islam is clearer and stronger about those roots, even though it has corrupt branches, we can learn to our own use some <clears throat> things from Islam about those roots. You can learn the same thing from, from primitive Africans. Do you have a follow-up? Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> there are certainly things that we can learn from any, any uh, given individual. There are certainly wise people in all religious traditions. That's really, I think, not an issue here. Uh, the question before us is, the, the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim. And you mentioned earlier that you, you know that there are good Muslims who are good Muslims because you've met them. And I think, well, sure, I, I know good Catholics who contracept, and yet they will tell you that they are perfectly good Catholics and they're completely observant. Uh, this is, of course, in defiance of Catholic Church teaching, and there are other people who would say, well, no, you're not actually good Catholics. And how is one to determine that? You go to the sources. You go to the teaching of the Church. And so I would submit that you only know a, uh, whether a Muslim is a good Muslim or not by Islamic standards. And we have to look at what their own texts and teachings say. And so, for example, the very charming story that you told about the crucifix and the pictures and the uh, Muslim student, there are several very notable things that I, I think ought to be added uh, for our edification tonight. One is, in Islamic tradition, Jesus will indeed come back at the end of the world. Not Muhammad, but Jesus will uh, return at the end of the world, and he will break all the crosses. That's Islamic tradition. In other words, he will destroy Christianity which is believed to be a perversion of the true teachings mm -hmm. of Jesus. And so he will break all the crosses, kill the pigs, because of course the Christians are the ones who eat the pork, and abolish the jizya, the tax that I mentioned before. In other words, he will destroy Christianity and Islamize the world. That's obviously one of those people that St. Paul mentions in Corinthians, when somebody comes to you with another Jesus, other than the one we have preached to you, you receive him readily enough. But he's not the Jesus certainly in remotely of uh, the New Testament. And further in regard to the pictures, while I, I applaud and appreciate this gentleman saying that he would protect a picture of uh, uh, who he terms the prophet Jesus and would revere, in other words, these religious figures. Actually, unfortunately, his co-religionists in the Balkans in particular 
uh, in, in Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia Herzegovina. There are their videotapes. You can find the tapes on YouTube of them going into churches, going into uh, Orthodox and, and Byzantine Catholic churches, and kicking down the icons of Jesus and of his mother, and burning the church, pulling the cross down off the top, destroying the, any, any representational art. Now, which one of these is really the good Muslim? Well, Islam does teach that representational art, particularly of prophets and religious figures, is a blasphemy mm -hmm. and ought rightly to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And thus, the people who are actually being the pious good Muslims were the ones who were destroying the pictures, of the icons of Jesus and his mother in the churches in the Balkans. This and is true. So this is true. But my, my Muslim student did not, would not deny that. But he said, if we had pictures, which we don't, which we regard as blasphemous and idolatrous, if we had pictures, we would defend them to the death. Now, that's, that's similar to, and here's my question for you. What do you think about this? The same student once asked to go to Mass with me. Uh, and I was surprised. And he said, don't get me wrong. I, I have absolutely no intention of, of becoming a Catholic or even interested in this, but it's, it, it's pure curiosity. But, but I, I, I promise to be respectful. So we went to a mass together, and he just sat there like, like a stone. He wouldn't move. He wouldn't uh, rise or kneel or, or in any way cooperate, but he was very quiet and respectful. Uh, and afterwards, I said, uh, well, what did you think? He said two things that impressed me. The first thing was, uh, this was in St. Mary's Chapel, which is a beautiful little stone Gothic chapel in the BC campus. Uh, he said, uh, how old is this building? I said, well, it's over 100 years old. It's the first building on the BC campus back in the 19th century. And he said, how old are the words that the priest uttered? I said, well, half of those were his own interpolations, and half of them, <laughs> and half of them were a sort of revision of the church's liturgy, which was retranslated a, uh, a couple of years ago. But the, the structure of the Mass goes back to the beginning. But the actual words are fairly modern words. He said, I thought so. I said, why? I knew he knew nothing about Catholic tradition. He said, well, uh, when I looked at the building, uh, the stones brought my spirit uh, closer to heaven. But when I listened to the words, they were like shallow babbling brooks simply moving horizontally on the earth. I thought that was rather perceptive. And then, then he said, uh, do, you, do you Christians really believe that Jesus is literally the Son of God? I said, yes, the Orthodox ones do, the modernists don't, the liberals don't, but yeah, both, both Protestants and Catholics believe that. And he said, and the difference between you Protestants and Catholics is you Catholics also believe that when that priest holds up that little round piece of bread, that really turns into Jesus, literally. I said, yes. He said, and that's why everybody got very quiet then. I said, yes, that was worship, that was adoration. Uh, and I said, I, I know you think that's blasphemous and ridiculous, uh, and Protestants do too except for Anglicans and Lutherans who believe in the real presence. Uh, by the way, one of the things that made me a Catholic, I was born and brought up as a, as a Calvinist, uh, was reading the Church Fathers and how they never questioned the real presence for a thousand years. I said, how could, how could, it, how could God allow such an error to exist in the Church for a thousand years? I mean, bowing down to bread and worshiping wine, thinking it's God? That's really bad. Uh, so he said, so you Catholics believe that that is really Jesus and Jesus is really Allah, fully divine? I said, yes. And he said, oh, I don't think so. And I said, well, I don't expect you to believe it. It's a difficult thing to believe. And of course, you're a Muslim. You don't believe that. He said, that's not what I mean. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to tell you what I mean. It's too embarrassing. So I, I tried to be nice and said, well, I, I, I suppose you mean you can't ever imagine uh, doing what the other people did, the Catholics, namely getting down on your knees before what seemed to be merely a piece of bread. He said, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, he said, I tried to imagine myself believing that, which I, of course, never would. It's blasphemous. But I don't really think that you believe it. Why not? It's, well, and he, and he stopped again. He said, I don't want to insult you. I said, I have thick skin. Try. So, he said, so I said, you, 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 you can't imagine yourself ever getting down on your knees. And he said, no, I can't imagine myself, if I believe that, ever getting up off my knees again. Now, there's a seriousness there. There's something there directed to a wrong object, the wrong religion, 
which I think we can learn some profound lessons from. Well, that's, that's actually the question before us then. Uh, the question is not really, are there pious Muslims or are there pious people who are Muslims? <coughs> that's manifest, that's obvious, that's, uh, that's easy. Uh, the question before us, as far as I understand it, is whether Islamic piety is something that really is in accord with the best elements of the human spirit and which exalts the human spirit, or rather whether it degrades it ultimately if somebody and follows would, it out rigorously. Would you agree that the answer to that question has to be neither a simple yes nor a simple no because there are obviously ingredients in Muslim piety that no Christian can applaud or agree with and other ingredients in Muslim piety equally important and equally orthodox which every Christian must agree with. Well I guess you know what I would Such say to that. Islam itself, the very heart of the religion total uh -huh. submission and surrender to God. That's the formula for a saint. Yes, absolutely. And as you very ably pointed out in your book, that's something that is common to Judaism and Christianity. It's not something that was originated in Islam. And so actually, I, I find myself agreeing, I must say, with the Byzantine Emperor Manuel Paleologos, who uh, was quoted so famously by Pope Benedict XVI a few years back, touching off worldwide riots and murders of innocent people, when he quoted him saying, uh, there's nothing that Muhammad brought that was new or original that was not inhuman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember the exact quote, but something like that. There's nothing evil and inhuman. Nothing that Muhammad brought that was new and original that was not evil and inhuman. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of good in the Quran that's taken from Judaism and Christianity. Where it becomes problematic is where it departs from that. Now we can see that because we're standing outside it and we understand probably most of the people in this room know a great deal about Christianity and maybe some of you a great deal about Judaism as well. And of course Judaism and Christianity come from the same wellsprings and are very similar in many important ways. Now that is something that we know then when we see these elements of Islam that they are uh, separable conceptually from the rest. But for Muslims these things are all a whole. Like you mentioned, for example, the Sufis and said the Sufis have a wonderful spirituality. They do have a wonderful spirituality. I, in my first book, Islam Unveiled, I quote in its entirety a poem written by the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was very deeply influenced by Sufism. Now the Ayatollah Khomeini also said that I spit on the foolish souls who believe that Islam is a religion of peace. He didn't have any trouble having these mystical flights <laughs> that exalted his soul and also thinking that it was part of the Muslim's responsibility to take up arms against unbelievers and there was no separation. It was all part of what he considered to be the devoutness of his observance. The also the Sufis for several hundred years have been at the forefront of the armed jihad warfare in Chechnya against the Russians. And Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood who I mentioned before, was very influenced by the Sufis and as he is establishing this violent arm of political Islam, he prescribed various Sufi exercises for the early brotherhood, members of the Brotherhood. And so, uh, it, it, to also Al-Ghazali, one of the foremost Sufis in history, is very, very clear that Jews and Christians must be fought against and subjugated. Uh, he had no trouble con <laughs> conceiving of these two things together. And so once again, I have to come back to the topic. The only good Muslim is a bad Muslim is a reference. It's a, perhaps a little bit of a coarse and insulting way to put it, as I explained before. But nonetheless, it contains a truth, and that is that there are elements of Islamic piety that are not separable from the rest, that are deeply embedded within the religion itself, in the core teachings of the Quran and of Muhammad, that lead one not toward God and not toward any authentic spirituality, but toward absolute evil. Would you agree, though, at least, that there are things in Islam that they have learned from Jews and Christians, not new things, the emperor is perfectly right, that we have forgotten and that therefore we can relearn from them? As Insofar well, as they question. are elements already of the yes. Jewish and Christian traditions, then certainly uh, we should look to uh, any pious people and say that piety is a good thing and ought to be fostered. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure we need to go to them to rediscover that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, uh, there's plenty within our own traditions that would, uh, mm -hmm. that, that would do that for us if we would simply recover those. Yeah, okay. I don't think we disagree about very much. <laughs> I'll see what I can it's do about. Fun, I'll see what I can do about that. <laughs>
the sower of discourse. Discord. Uh, not discourse. Dis sower of discourse is good. Yeah, no, discord. Um, okay. First, I would like to ask, and, and after my questions, I'm going to open to the audience. I'd like to ask Mr. Spencer. When we say, if you say the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim, presumably you mean good as in good for us as Christians living in the West. In other words, what good as in to our benefit, to our safety, to our free, pr pr promoting our freedom, our ability to worship, <coughs> evangelize, live in peace. Um, but if you hope that Muslims are not true to their own religion and are not true to their own conscience, then aren't you hoping that they are disobeying the, vo the voice of conscience and therefore damning their own souls? Isn't that a perverse thing for us to hope for? And isn't it a little crass for us to hope that Muslims go to hell just because it makes them less likely to kill us? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I don't accept the premise. Wonderfully uncomfortable question. <laughs> Yes, it's a wonderful question, but I think it's there's a bit of sophistry there. Uh, I don't think that God would ever that that that, that the, the the true living existing God, who is God of all the creation, would ever condemn someone to hell for doing evil that he thought was the right thing or doing the right thing that he thought was evil. There is absolute good and absolute, there is absolute good and absolute evil. These things are clear. These things are actually uh, uh, relatively universal across religious traditions with the notable exception of Islam. In The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis's book, uh, he has at the, uh, at, is an appendix, as of course I know you're aware, a, uh, a, a listing of various quotations establishing what he calls the Tao, the way, which is uh, what he is explaining are universally held moral principles among Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, etc. Very notably absent are quotations from the Quran and from the teachings of Muhammad that would support these u otherwise universal moral principles of thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and so on and so on. Uh, Islam does uphold those things, but for Muslims only. Uh, there is, uh, in other words, pretty much you can say all of the things that people say in the media about Islam are true if you add four Muslims at the end. But like the Quran, Islam is a religion of peace, four Muslims. Islam is a religion of tolerance, four Muslims, and so on. So the, the point is that when we're talking about people following their conscience, there is the, there's a great danger, I think, a worse danger, the, the, the danger of hellfire for anyone is to become convinced that to do evil is good. And thus, we should do everything we can to try to show them that that is a demonic deception. Amen. Would you like to respond to his answer? <coughs> or not? I think it is very probable that it is indeed a demonic deception. And I think it is very probable that the Quran is a mixture of three things. It claims to be a divine revelation. Uh, it could conceivably come from three and only three sources, the human, the demonic, or the divine. Uh, in the Catholic tradition, private revelations are not infallible. The devil loves to mess up private revelations, to confuse even the saints, and to get whatever falsehood he can in with truths. It seems to me, uh, in the Quran, you have a mixture of divine revelation, at least influenced by, if not totally derived from Judaism and Christianity. Uh, but maybe, maybe God sent an angel to Muhammad to get some messages through, and maybe a few of them got through, I don't know. So are you saying that Islam is, a, is on the par of a private revelation, like Fatima or Lourdes? No, no, certainly not. But I am saying that there may be some maybe supernatural Medjugorje. good, <laughs> as well as supernatural evil, in the experiences that Muhammad claims to have had in that cave, mixed with Muhammad's own very human uh, proclivities to a mixture of good and evil, which would explain the mixture. Well, I don't know, you know, I, I go back to the cave, <coughs> and the very earliest hadith, the earliest traditions about Muhammad are all about what happened to him in that cave. And it's very fascinating, because if you were a Muslim going to Muslim school to, to uh, learn about Islam, then you would learn that the angel Gabriel, Muhammad was praying in a cave, and the angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him to recite, 
and he recited. That's what Quran means, recitation. And over the next 23 years, he was given recitations to recite that were the words of God, the word of God, the perfect and eternal word of God that had existed forever with God in paradise and was then being transmitted to earth through Gabriel to Muhammad. Now, that's a very nice story. That's sort of the Sunday school version. Or we could say the, the Friday school version. <laughs> but in the actual hadith about the incident, the angel is not named as an angel or as Gabriel. He is some sort of spiritual being who then presses Muhammad very hard on his chest so that he thought he was going to die and tells him to recite. And he says, I can't, I can't read because he was thinking I have to get a printed text and then, or a written text and then recite it. And he presses him even harder and all the breath is going out of him. He's like a cosmic thug pressing on Muhammad, <laughs> forcing him, saying recite. And finally Muhammad says, okay, okay. And he goes home, he's shaking with fear and he says to his wife, cover me with a blanket. He's, he's, he's shivering and he says, woe is me, either poet or possessed. By poet, he didn't mean Rod McHugh. And he meant like somebody who is receiving ecstatic demonic visions. And so, is that really the kind of story that we would expect if it was Gabriel, the one who appears to the Blessed Mother in the Gospel of Luke and tells her that she's going to be the mother of Jesus? It's a very different kind of story. It's a very different character of story. And I think that in itself is very telling and revealing. It sounds suspiciously like some of the disturbing stories in the early parts of the Old Testament. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Uh, now, <laughs> okay, good. Now we're all really disturbed and unsettled. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that there's really any comparable story in the Old Testament. I, 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 I appreciate the, the... Jacob wrestling with the angel? Jacob, the force, the, the, Jacob breaking wrestling the bone. with the angel. What does the angel do to him that would terrify Jacob into thinking he's demon-possessed? He breaks his hip bone. He d Jacob doesn't go home and say, I think I've just been demon-possessed, does he? Mm. All right, now I've got a question for Professor Kreef. Um, couldn't we learn what we need to learn from Muslims by reading their books, but nevertheless energetically fighting their attempts to assert themselves in American society, restricting their entrance into our countries, and just generally fighting political Islam and reducing committing our, protecting our own religious freedom and our own political freedom by aggressively imposing our own values on our own societies. Uh, in other words, not permitting them polygamy, not permitting them honor killing or wife beating or any of the other aspects of Sharia that they, that they claim to be asserting, in some cases trying to insert into our legal, the legal system of Great Britain. In other words, couldn't we get all this from your book? Well, your book t tells us what we need to gain from Islam, and so, okay, fine, they can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> the long and complete and nuanced version of my answer to your question is yes. <laughs> we might all actually agree more than I realize. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, on the other hand, on the other hand, I would not necessarily condemn the idea of a foundation who, which arose and came up with this flaky proposal. Uh, the clash of civilizations, Islam versus the West, could be at least mitigated, if not overcome, if we simply spent some millions of dollars buying a fleet of planes and using them for a kind of a double transportation system. Let's take all our pop psychologists and put them in Muslim countries and let's tell them to send us some fiery mullahs to give us some spine. I like that, I like that idea better than the one that, that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu once expressed in the Knesset that, we, that the, they should translate sex in the city into Persian and drop the DVDs all across Iran. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's... it's it's an Which, a tempting idea, I have to say, but that's my Machiavellian side. Well, what the mullahs would do if they were imported here, I mean, we're already seeing uh, what's happening. Uh, so I don't think that that really uh, would necessarily be a good idea. Uh, but it's interesting to note also in terms of secularism and Islam that uh, a lot of people have the idea 
that, uh, and this is absolutely germane to our point here tonight, the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim, it might not even be so that a bad Muslim is a good Muslim because uh, secularism has often been posited as an antidote to all this. And people say, well, they're so, they're so pious, and their piety leads them into dangerous and violent directions, and therefore we have to make them less pious, so we'll airlift sex in the city into uh, Iran or whatever. Uh, but actually, you know, American culture is already there. Uh, and there is plenty of uh, uh, sex in the city all over the Islamic world. Make no mistake, uh, Charles Glass, who is an American journalist, who wrote a very fascinating book called Tribes with Flags uh, in the 80s. He uh, was actually, the book Tribes with Flags is an account of his crazy decision to walk from Antioch in southern Turkey to Cairo, down Lebanon into Israel, all the way down. And of course, in Lebanon, he was kidnapped by Hezbollah and held as a hostage. <laughs> and while he was there, uh, he uh, found that his captors were listening to Michael Jackson records and Madonna and that kind of thing. And they would come up to him and they would say, do you think American girls would find me attractive? <laughs> and meanwhile, they're holding the Kalashnikovs on him, you know? And, and then they, they go and pray in Allah Akbar and they're going to slit his throat. Uh, but uh, incidentally, he had, you might want to read that book. It's very interesting. It's, it's a straight journalistic kind of account of what happened. But then at the end, it gets very interesting because he starts having visions of the Virgin Mary who tells him how to escape from his captivity. And he does follow her directions and escapes. I have been told by numerous missionaries, most of them Protestants, that something is happening in the Islamic world in the last few decades that has never happened before conversions to Christianity are happening yes. and almost every single one of them has to do with the vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yes, yes. That's, uh, there are visions of uh, Mary that have appeared and been seen by really many thousands of people. Zaytun. It's, very, it's phenomenon. Zaytun. It's, more, more people saw that oh, miracle yeah. than any other miracle in the entire history of the world. Yes. Two million in people. In Cairo, standing on top of a church. Yes. Muslims and Christians together see yes. the Blessed Virgin Mary. So, yes, yeah. something is happening. And she, unlike you, was made work of making peace signs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm all for peace. But I think that uh, uh, peace without a realistic appraisal of the situation is just naive and could be suicidally naive. I agree. I totally agree. The only, the only thing that you said tonight, other than your, your conclusion, that I disagree with, and I think it was just a slip of the tongue, was you spoke of absolute good and absolute evil. Now, God is certainly absolutely good, but even the devil is not absolutely evil because yes. God created him. So how could Islam be worse than the devil? I, 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 let me give you... Uh, 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 I, I don't want to speak about the devil, but... Uh, he doesn't interest me, but chapter 91, verse 7 of the Quran says that God places evil within the heart of man, which is markedly different from the Christian idea that, uh, that evil is the absence of God's presence in the soul, and evil is a rejection of God, not something that God actually actively encourages. But the Bible also says, I create good and evil, evil there being death and suffering, That's a rather different than kind. moral evil, rather than sin. But yes. there, there, the Quran means that. Well, we could, we could trade verses. Wait, wait, wait. Can we, can we, we make, I think, I, are you referring to the question of free will in Islam? I think that's something... Yeah, that actually, is. that's just where I was going to go. Chapter 32, verse 13 of the Quran. Said, uh, Allah says, we. He always speaks in the royal we, even though he's in absolute unity. And he says, if we had willed, we could have guided all men to the truth. But instead, we will fill hell with jinns, genies, and men. So we, in other words, he's saying, he could have... This is, this is the, the God of Islam speaking, saying, I, I could have brought everybody to a knowledge of the truth, but I just want to fill up hell. But like, like Augustine, most Muslims also claim to believe in free will as well as infallible predestination. I don't know where you're finding them because actually the Quran decisively rejects the idea of free will and says repeatedly that Allah leads astray those whom he wills, does not allow to go astray, but he leads astray those whom he wills and guides those whom he wills. And then this verse that I just quoted to you is also echoed in <coughs> chapter 7, verse 179, which also says, I will fill hell 
with men. He could have decided to do otherwise, but he has decided to condemn certain people to a very luridly and deep, d uh, lovingly, lavishly described vision of hell in the Quran. And he's sending them there because he wants to. Perhaps, Dr. Kree, if I can ask you, as a, as a former Calvinist, uh, in the Regensburg Address, Pope Benedict was talking about commonalities between Islam and the <coughs> Calvinism in their rejection of the idea that we can reason about God because mm -hmm. analogy does not apply to God. Mm -hmm. We cannot reason about God. There can really be no theology. And uh, Pope Benedict was talking about this as a kind of the beginning of the secularization of the Western mind. Um, it, it seems to me that when the Muslims rejected the Mutazilite yep. option, when they rejected philosophy, they rejected yep. Avicenna, they rejected Averroes, at the same time Thomas Aquinas was taking these thinkers and trying to reconcile faith and reason, the Muslims cho saw an irreparable divide, an insuperable divide, and they chose faith and ins opposed to reason. Mm -hmm. it's, Pope Benedict seemed to be saying that with Calvinism and with the Reformation, the long process began of the West rejecting faith and only accepting reason. So, in a sense, is, is there some sense in which Islam and the secular West are kind of mirror images of each other, or two yes. broken pieces of a puzzle? That's very profound. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he didn't make it up, the Pope made it up. <laughs> I'm proud of myself for remembering it. Robert Riley's, Robert Riley's recent book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, is very enlightening on that. Yeah. Yes, it is a desperate philosophical mistake. It's voluntarism and nominalism. It's Occamism. Yes. Yes. All right. Are there questions from the audience? Okay. I'm, I'm seeing a parallel with the Sufis in your putting the, their piety that you look to them and the Pharisees and their piety, which was really, uh, you know, dirty <coughs> rags. It was because the inside was corrupt. And so that's, that's what I put to you is the Sufi's piety. Even the gospel writers didn't say the only good Pharisee is a bad Pharisee. In fact, there were good Pharisees. Nicodemus was one of them. Joseph of Arimathea was one of them. Gamaliel was one of them, St. Paul's teacher. Here you have three very good Pharisees. Although many of the Pharisees were wicked people. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go one other part of her. Um, this gentleman here. Um, both of you came from Mr. Spencer. Um, we know that politics is a, is a practical art that often brings together uh, strange bedfellows <coughs> and factions and coalitions of groups and persons who would ordinarily be opposed to each other. From that purely practical standpoint, um, couldn't we say that the Christian West and Islam, whether Muslim individuals or uh, political groups or nations, can, that we can make a deal with the devil, so to speak, and, and cooperate with them in the United Nations? Uh, on the global front to fight the kinds of evils that Dr. Craig was talking about? Well, I don't have any objection to doing that. Obviously, it worked in Beijing. And uh, I think the only hazard of it is that people don't recognize the limitations of it. Uh, here again, I'm all for peace, but we need to go into such things with open eyes and understand that we are dealing with a group that will never regard non-Muslims as their equals and will not regard us as uh, any more their friends because we have cooperated on these various ventures than they did if we had not cooperated. Uh, there's a great, in other words, uh, you know, I think, for example, the American military's idea of going in and handing out candy on the streets of Baghdad and Kabul and, and, and uh, basketballs and, and, and going in and building hospitals and schools and roads and all that, it's all great. Uh, but the, it's predicated on the idea that we will win over their hearts and minds by doing that. Whereas, the, as if, for example, they hate us because we aren't being nice to them. 
and or they hate us because of our immorality or they hate us for whatever whatever other reason when actually if you go back to the Quran it says fight against the Jews and Christians not just the immoral Jews and Christians or the Jews and Christians whose foreign policy you dislike or something like that just fight against the Jews and Christians and so there is ultimately for a Muslim who takes that seriously ultimately no accord is possible unless we submit or convert and so certainly some sort of limited partnership is obviously possible because it's happened. If we're but, shrewd about it though? Yeah, shrewdness is, is, is very good in this case, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One second, I'm checking the time. Okay. Um, gentleman in the back in the blue shirt. We oftentimes uh, hear in the media when there's an event such as what took place at Christmas Day Bomb or Fort Hood <coughs> that a Muslim has been radicalized. Uh, to either one or both, uh, what is it that radicalized them? Well, I know how Bob's going to answer that question. They haven't been <laughs> radicalized because Islam is essentially radical. Uh, they haven't been turned into radicals from beginning by being moderate Muslims. Rather, moderate <coughs> Muslims probably began by being more radical Muslims and then softened their religion. And that's probably historically true. Uh, but we certainly can hope for a softening of Muslims. It has happened before in history. It can happen again because Islam is like Protestantism. It has a Bible, but there are so many different interpretations of it possible without a, an infallible magisterium that there are no preset limits to emphases and interpretations that could be in the future. Uh, I don't personally hold much hope for a, a moderate and liberal Islam suddenly arising in our lifetime, but uh, it's not in principle impossible, <laughs> so I think we should encourage any movement in that direction. Let me, oh, I wait, wait, yeah, can I add? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to click. What would soften, <coughs> what softens Muslims? Well, in the first place, I actually did want to answer the okay. question, which was what radicalizes them. You, it's generally an appeal to Quranic texts and teachings. Mm -hmm. It's generally a call to say, you are not being a good Muslim unless you do this. Mm -hmm. Chapter 9, verse 111 of the Quran offers paradise, actually guarantees paradise, I should say, to those who kill and are killed for Allah. And this is used today by suicide bombing recruiters mm -hmm. to get people to strap bombs on themselves and they go kill some infidels, they get killed in the process, they're guaranteed a place in paradise. And that's a very powerful in inducement if you really believe that this is how things work. Now, what would soften these things? I'm, I, I wouldn't say that it's impossible, but Islam, we should know in the first place, is not really like Protestantism at all. Protestantism, as far as I understand it, operates on the principle of the Bible alone is the authority. And so anybody can read it and come to a different view, because no book interprets itself. But at this, in, in Islam, there are authorities. They're, they're the ulama of various countries, the religious scholars of various countries who issue fatwa, which are rulings that are considered binding upon those within the jurisdiction. There are uh, the schools of jurisprudence, the madhadhib. There are eight of those, nine of those rather. Uh, incidentally, eight of those nine uh, do admit to the uh, utility of artificial contraception, and so that's something that they differ from the Catholic Church about. Uh, at least the teaching of the Catholic Church. The, um, the uh, teaching authority of those schools of jurisprudence is considered to be binding upon the Muslims to, who, who adhere to one or the other of the schools. Although it's not a matter of conversion or some kind of rupture if one moves from one to the other. They're regionally distributed and generally if you grow up in one area then you interpret the Quran according to the teachings of these various schools. As I said before, there is no sector school that doesn't teach the necessity to wage war against unbelievers and subjugate them. Could there arise some kind of Islam in the future that didn't teach that or actively rejected it? I suppose anything is possible, but it would have to come with a wholesale rejection of Quranic literalism. And that means, in other words, that they would be considered by traditional and mainstream Muslims to be bad Muslims. Right. Mm. They would have to be like Jesuits at Boston College. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe the Jesuits can help soften up the Muslims. <laughs> uh, the gentleman back there. Yeah, but uh, isn't, the, isn't the, the, uh, the real problem the fact that Europe 
doesn't have enough of, uh, you know, they can't replace themselves, and the fact that Europe will probably end up being Muslim within 30 years, and that Germany will be totally Muslim within 50 years, isn't, isn't that the real, real problem? And, uh, you know, going to, uh, you know, it's just, a, it seems to me that, you know, I mean, uh, what Peter Krebs says that, you know, well, I bring the student here, he, he understands, he, you know, he, he, he's in the church with me, and, he, and he's respectful. And then I think about what happened two days ago, is it, or three days ago in, in Iraq. I mean, is, is, is the slaughter in the Catholic there, Church in Baghdad? Who, who was there, you know, in, uh, with Peter Krebs? I don't know, 20 years ago, 10, 10 years ago, is it possible that he could be back wherever he is, and he might have even been in the church, you know, two days ago? That's the problem, I think, with uh, you know that we we have with the Muslim faith. Is there a question? Well, I guess the question is, how do we how do we address that? Which part of it? Uh, the part is that we uh, they're schizophrenic. I mean, here they are in the, in the United States. They're perfectly uh, uh, because uh, it's 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 part of the faith that says when you're outnumbered to be a pacifist. When when they're when they're amongst themselves, when 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 they're in a group, they seem to lose control. So how do we handle that? What what, what is what is our philosophy? How do what is what, what how how do we how do we address that practical problem? Okay. Well, <laughs> yes, yeah, ma'am. I, I would like to uh, amplify just a bit a couple of these points uh, because Dr. Crape said earlier that most Muslims in the West don't practice polygamy and don't practice these other uh, elements of the faith that we would consider to be noxious, uh, and I think are objectively so. Uh, actually, that's not entirely true. There actually is, uh, at, even by uh, most recent accounts, I believe, uh, was it? 20 or 30,000 polygamous couples in the United States, polygamous families that is, polygamous groups, uh, that uh, are Muslim. And it was very noteworthy that Ibrahim Hooper uh, of the Council on American Islamic Relations, which is a Hamas-linked Muslim Brotherhood front group that masquerades as a moderate organization. Uh, hi, Ibrahim. Uh, <laughs> Ibrahim Hooper actually said uh, in, in response to that news item, about polygamy in the United States, he said, yes, there is uh, polygamy among Muslims in the United States, and they, uh, Islamic scholars differ as to whether it's permissible. Notice he didn't say anything about American law, making it illegal. Right. He didn't seem to care about that at all. It was only the Islamic scholars. And also, just today in uh, uh, Seattle, was it Seattle? No, San Diego, I'm sorry. One of those S cities out west. Uh, he, uh, there was a, a cleric, an Islamic cleric, a preacher of nonviolence and tolerance, well regarded in his community, named Muhammad Muhammad Muhammad. I'm not making that up. And Muhammad 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 was arrested today for aiding the jihad in Somalia. Uh, and so, uh, yes, what are we to do about this now, uh, now that I have just made the, made the question worse? Uh, well, first thing we have to do is assess it realistically and understand that uh, really uh, the, anybody who professes the Islamic faith, if he delves into the teachings of his own religion, is somebody who can end up being very dangerous to us. Now, that doesn't mean that people should be rounded up and put into camps or any of this nonsense, but we need to enforce our own laws about sedition and to uh, formulate some sane immigration policies and recognize that this is an ideological <laughs> conflict and not some sort of a problem of racism or all these things that usually cloud these issues. May I ask you a question? Certainly. Which do you think is worse in the eyes of God? Muslim polygamy or the fruit of the Enlightenment by which we say that a man can marry a man? Well, see, both of them. You know, it's very interesting that in your book, uh, in Dr. Craig's book, he has a chapter about uh, marriage and writes very movingly, as, as he uh, can do so well, about uh, the nature of marriage. And he has the Muslim uh, expatiating upon the nature of marriage and the respect that a, that a husband should have for his wife and the respect that a wife should have for her husband and so on and so on. The, the interesting thing to note, however, is that that is not the concept of Islamic marriage at all. In Islamic marriage, the woman is essentially chattel. And actually, the, the word for, ma for marriage in Islam is an obscenity in Arabic. 
I'm not making this up, but the theological term for marriage in Islam is a word that people don't say in polite company. And it's because it's, it's really a very degraded idea. And so I, I, you ask me which one is worse. I, I think that both are deviations from the kind of uh, mutual respect and mutual self-giving that the Catholic Church envisions as but marriage. doesn't the Quran also say that you may have four wives, but only if you can respect all of them and do justice to all of them? It, and it, shouldn't it doesn't say for, respect all of them. It says you can have four... I happen to have it right here. It says you can respect... You can have four wives if you can treat them all equally. In other words, if you, if you treat them all the same, if you're beastly to all of them, then you can have them. You could interpret it that way. It doesn't say anything about respect. Yes. Okay. First of all, I'd like to say that it's nice to be at a college uh, to be able to have a debate on Islam where the faculty and the students are not outside shouting obscenities. That's what usually happens when yeah. I speak in college. <laughs> we say that for the classroom. <laughs> I, was at, I was at Temple University in Philadelphia just last month, and there were protesters outside shouting about racism and how I was such a terrible and person. So loud so we could we barely can, hear, yeah. hear ourselves in there. Uh, so what I would like to um, address is this growing uh, allegiance between radical <laughs> Islam and not only the American left, but the global left, ideological left in general, and a couple of recent examples is when Bill O'Reilly went on The View, a left of center show, and he mentioned that we were attacked by Muslims. Joy Behar got up and walked out, and then right after that, Juan Williams was fired from NPR for saying that he gets nervous when he sees Muslims getting on an airplane, and that's, I'm sure it's something most of us innately feel. And, and so I'm trying to figure out, you know, if you guys have any thoughts on, on this growing, you know, because I feel browbeaten anytime I want to speak about Islam in public, and sometimes, honestly, I feel like my life might be in danger because of it. So why the, why the alliance? Well, I would like to point out that uh, Al-Qaeda has, Al has issued a fatwa against Mr. Spencer. He's the number four on their list of Americans. With a bullet. Yeah. <laughs> So that's why he has a bodyguard here tonight. Um, but I would like both of you to be able to, to respond to that. Why would, it, would the left feel an affinity with Islam? It seems bizarre to us. Do you have any insights, Professor? Yeah, because the left wants to feel an affinity with everybody. <laughs> except <laughs> us. Except, except <laughs> right. <laughs> the left hates America. Yeah. And because the left hates America and they see that it's the, 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 the Islamic jihadists hate America, they see a friend there. Yeah. And they see somebody they can cooperate with. And also the left doesn't understand religion, doesn't take religion seriously, and thinks, well, yes, they're nutty religious people, but we can control that. We, we'll, we'll take care of that after we've defeated the real enemy. Dinesh D'Souza wrote a book called The Enemy Within. Yeah, one of the, the very one of the worst books I've ever read. One of the <laughs> best books I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I guess we took it out now. <laughs> I, I heard Dinesh debate uh, Alan uh, Wolf at Boston College, uh, and it was the most one-sidedly embarrassing debate I ever heard. And Boston College censored the debate and refused to allow the tape script out because Dinesh totally demolished Alan Wolf who is a classic liberal, who says, we're all equal, why can't we just get along? Well, certainly, I, I, uh, I wasn't at the debate. I have debated Dinesh myself. Uh, you can see the uh, debate on YouTube if you're interested. We were debating because Dinesh contends in his book, The Enemy at Home, that essentially Britney Spears caused 9-11. Uh, <laughs> that uh, the American, that American pop culture going into the Islamic world made these straight-laced moral people rise up and strike back against us. That, of course, completely ignores, and I don't think Dinesh is even aware, of the fact that they were fighting jihads against us before pop culture was immoral. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's noteworthy that Sai Kuto uh, the, uh, one of the key theorists of the Muslim Brotherhood came to the United States in 1948 and spent two years here in Colorado 
and he wrote about his experiences with America and how they hardened him in his uh, understanding that America had to be destroyed and that it was this deeply immoral principality. And uh, in 1948, you know, Doris Day was on the top of the pop charts. <laughs> Uh, the, the idea that, uh, that that kind of thing was immoral, it perhaps betrays the fact that, actually if you look back even in crusader literature, you find that uh, the Islamic world generally always thinks of the Christian world as immoral. And the immorality is ultimately beside the point because, as I said before, the teachings of Islam say fight the Jews and Christians. It doesn't say leave the moral ones alone and only fight the immoral ones. It says fight the Jews and Christians. Is the difference then between the Muslims and the Christians that during the Crusades, uh, Muslims put chastity belts on their men and it said make war not love? <laughs> I think that I think that in Latin is the slogan of the college. Um, Mr. Harry, a question from an actual Thomas More student. One, we got one into the room. Mr. Stephen Harry, um, I was wondering um, what differences uh, are there between our concept or a Christian concept of ultimate beatitude or heaven and the Muslim concept of that and what effect that may have on motivations, like you mentioned earlier, um, to lose your life or take a life for Allah. I mean, it's an embarrassingly... Yeah, I'm going to let him go first so you can respond. Okay. <laughs> I'm just being okay. fair here. Uh, 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 Charles de Foucault, who of course uh, is, is blessed now, is that right? In any case, uh, Charles de Foucault lived in North Africa and was killed by, uh, by jihadis there. But the point is that earlier in his life, before he dedicated himself to uh, that kind of life in North Africa, he essentially was a libertine. And when he looked at the Islamic idea of paradise, and he, he, he uh, first encountered Muslims and the Quranic teaching about paradise and, and, and the afterlife, he said, well, he had tasted those pleasures and he knew they were not the ultimate good and not the ultimate joy and ultimate happiness. And so he knew that Islam was not the true faith because he knew that the soul needed something else. But the Islamic vision of paradise is just as you may have already heard. It's essentially what you might expect a 14-year-old boy in Arabia to dream up as being the highest good. Uh, lots of girls, uh, lots of cool breezes, lots to drink. Uh, it's, you know, a pleasure palace. This is you why they come to Boston College. You could start... <laughs> well, you said, I, I, don't know, I wonder why they don't go to Vegas. You could start a very successful nightclub and call it Muslim Paradise. And, uh, I've been to it would be a very pious, very pious place. Yes, I think, yes. I think when, when the pious Muslim gets to Paradise, he will indeed find 40 virgins, but they will be nuns. <laughs> There's a great picture of 40 nuns with guns. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> given, given all that's been said here, I'm curious um, if I can hear maybe both, of, both of the panelists uh, speak to what our, our public policy should look like with respect to Muslim practice in the United States. Um, what, I mean, I, I don't, it's, I, I, I don't no, question, no question, even-handed, equal rights, uh, no, no privileges, no, nothing special. Here's American law. It is not specifically Muslim or anti-Muslim, Christian or anti-Christian. It's based on universal human rights. If they don't like it, too bad. Yeah. I mean, I'm all for that. jokes about, about I would support the right of Muslims to build a, a, a mosque or a Muslim center by 9-11. I would also support the right of uh, an anti-Muslim Jewish organization to, to write, put a temple right next to it. In Saudi Arabia? I, I believe absolutely in, uh, in, in human rights and the United States Constitution and that Muslims should be accorded all those rights. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that the supremacist initiatives, including the Triumphal Mosque at Ground Zero, uh, sh should be allowed. That's not really a religious, religious freedom issue at all. It's a question of whether a mosque like the Dome of the Rock built on the site of the Jewish Temple, or like the Hagia Sophia converted from the grandest church in Christendom, 
should be allowed to mark the victory of the Muslims on 9-11, which is how it will be understood in the Islamic world, but that's a side issue. What should we do in terms of public policy, Dr. Kraft is right, enforce our laws and uh, not accord any special rights, which Muslims are pressing for today in all kinds of ways, to Muslims or anyone else. And if we did that, then a lot of this problem would be solved. There's also an example, I think, for us in how the MacArthur occupation government in Japan after World War II treated state Shinto. Shintoism was the militaristic fuel that fueled the <coughs> Japanese war machine, the militaristic ideology. And after World War II, when MacArthur was in charge in Japan, he said Shintoism as an individual religious faith should not be interfered with at all. But Shintoism will have no place in the government or in making public policy with any preference to any other with 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 preference over any other group. Wasn't part of your wasn't a major major thrust of your argument that um, that Orthodox Muslim practice kind of encourages like just bad behavior? Yeah. And, and, and so, so what you have here is a situation where we have to understand that there are elements of Orthodox Muslim practice that Muslims are going to have to give up in the United States because they are not in accord with American law. Hmm. And that is not something that is without precedent, and it is not something that's against the First Amendment. I look at Mormon polygamy, which has come up already. Yep. The United States government did not hesitate to outlaw polygamy, even though it was a religious tenet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this was considered to be something that was in the national interest. I don't think that's in, in the least incompatible with the First Amendment to understand that there are certain elements of Islam that Muslims must not practice in the United States because they are against the national interest, and and in contradiction with the freedoms guaranteed to us by the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. All right. Mr. Dobbins, right from, from a, a Thomas More student who is joining the Israeli army next year. Um, Not our, part of our ROTC program. <laughs> um, Louder. I, I was wondering if uh, you could answer this for me. I'm, this is, I'm sure you're probably at least familiar with the supremacy clause in the Quran that says that uh, in order to honor Allah, you must kill all the infidels, first the Saturdays, and then the Sundays. So how is it that you justify the statement that it would be easier to work with enlightenment, enlightenment than uh, when their view is inherently, when the Muslim view is inherently con uh, contradictory and to uh, Judeo-Christian values where the Enlightenment's uh, view is that. Okay, no, first, you had a clarification? Uh, yeah, I did want to point out that the Quran does not say uh, to kill all the uh, infidels. It says, actually, it says kill the uh, mushrikeen, which are the polytheists, those who are, commit shirk, the association of partners with Allah. Usually, but not universally, Jews and Christians are not considered to be mushrikeen. They are considered to be uh, people of the book. And the people of the book have a third option. They don't have to be killed or converted. They can be subjugated as dhimmis. Uh, ultimately, however, there is a hadith that is very pernicious where Muhammad says, this is not in the Quran, it's a hadith, but he says, the end times will not come until Muslims kill Jews. And the Jews hide behind trees and the trees cry out and say, oh Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. Now that is an authenticated hadith, that is one that is considered to be part of Islamic doctrine. And so it is considered to be a laudable practice for a Muslim to kill a Jew because it's something that hastens the coming of the end times in which all things will be consummated. But anyway, it's not specifically in the Quran like that, that's all. Did you want to respond to Well, most Muslims in the West do not in fact believe or practice that. Uh, and I suppose Bob must be right in saying that if everything in the Quran must be accepted, literally, and practiced, then these are bad Muslims. So, in that sense, I would agree with him that the best Muslim is a bad Muslim. We have agreement. <laughs> now we're going to sing Kumbaya, which is our school fight song. <laughs> I would like to thank you, and we're out of time, I would like to thank you all for coming and asking such intelligent questions and crowding in in these potato famine coffin ship like conditions uh, for, for such a long time. Thank you very much and thank you to the speakers.